for uh, my presentation is on the speeches of the viceroys of British India. So again, um, why should one examine colonial language? What's the importance of colonial language? Um, to me, I would say that there's the dynamics of empire emerge in colonial language, particularly in relation to power and race. So um, if you think about education specifically, Thomas Paddington Macaulay was an important figure in setting up English education in India. And he infamously said that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. And um, in this statement itself, you can see that he granted the superiority of the English language over so-called Oriental languages through education. This education in English was then tied to employment. You could work in colonial government administration if you understood English. Um, this continued in the law as well. So a British colonial law worked as a tool that was not only inherently unapproachable to the vast majority rule, but also actively worked to preserve the superiority of empire by creating law rooted in the assumption of a fundamental inherent difference between British and Indian, which here in Elizabeth Kolsky's um, uh, speech is, uh, says it's Indian human nature. And in fact, the goal of education was to try and overcome this Indian human nature. So legal language was shaped by racial ideas and then also these ideas came into ruling. Um, and then eventually, I'm so sorry, my Zoom is, okay. Um, and if you think about legal language also became a, a currency of power for resistance. Um, in terms of education law coming together for Indians. So a lot of significant figures in the freedom struggle for India were in fact lawyers, people who knew English and people who had command over legal language, um, like Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of India, and Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who wrote the constitution of India. So um, colonial language tells a lot about empire. But why examine the viceroy? Where does he fit into this? The Viceroy's office was the highest in the land, is a rep representative of the British crown in India. So in this context, there's no better figure to study. And um, studying his political position on events through his speeches and our knowledge of the events of colonialism can reveal new insights into empire and how um, empire evolved over time. And specifically, a digital humanities approach uh, to the Viceroy works well because um, there are a lot of individual Viceroys whose biographies are out there, but there are very few texts about the office as a whole. And um, a digital humanities approach can also show how the how the people in the role um, each adopted it, how the role itself changed over time with change in empire and uh, history. So this is my intervention. Um, I apply text analysis methods to a corpus of the Viceroy's speech. Um, and through the Viceroy, I aim to read Empire. The speech, uh, there were 84 speeches in my corpus uh, by, made by Viceroy's who ruled between 1880 and 1947. Uh, this includes six speeches made by 14 different Viceroy's. So the split was three made at the very beginning of a Viceroy's rule and three made at the end. Uh, the reason for this was I thought that people, when the Viceroy first come into the role, who would he want to speak to um, first in this position of power? Where would he want to be? Um, so eventually the conclusion I drew and which I'll be discussing more today is that the Viceroy typically addressed commercial government bodies on topics such as the economy and the growing pressures of the world wars. And they used these speeches to present an image of strong British rule, even amid um, shape amid um, past events that were the end of empire. Um, so my methodology was that I I found these books in the public uh, in the public library uh, in books posted by the public library of India, um, and then I put them into txt files and edited these files for OCR errors uh, and added metadata. So I added the official title of the speech, the speaker the audience and the location. And um, then I had created a Python file, which used tools within the natural language toolkit uh, to analyze my corpus. So I got details like word frequency, correlations, full equations, lexical diversity, 
um, etc. And eventually I produced data representations of things I found using my file. And uh, that's what I will be showing you all today. So um, first to talk about lexical diversity. Lexical diversity is the ratio of unique words, the total number of words. And as this graph indicates, actually there was very little lexical diversity between the Viceroy's speeches. Um, it suggests then that they constantly referred to the same script um, and had perhaps had a unified political position that very little over time. And through making the same speeches, they not only ensured then their ind individual success, but the success of the role. They didn't want to actually um, say something different from each other. And um, these are speeches, remember, made at the beginning and end of the vice rule. So it indicated they had a similar agenda when starting, similar agenda when finishing their rule that just continued from one to the next. But then who exactly were the vice rules talking to? So if you look at the most frequent words and most frequent biograms in the corpus, um, the words are uh, India is a count of 659. The total number of words was 38497 words. Um, and government, government India so suggests they're talking, of course, about the government of India. But through words like gentlemen and Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, um, it suggests that the people they were talking to were people in high positions of office who had some kind of power. So if you look at exactly who these people were, so I've taken India and government India by audience. Um, there's... Um, we can break down who each of these groups are. So the Bombay Municipal Corporation and New Delhi Municipal Committee are government bodies. The Bombay Chamber of Commerce and Indian Merchants Chamber and Bureau are commercial groups. The Muslim Committee of Bombay represents religious interests and members of the Baikula Club refers to an elite club for Europeans in Bombay. Uh, and it's a social group, but it, and as you can see, it's the one where the most, um, where the words are mentioned most. But um, it's important to note that members of this club were people in the colonial administration and army as well. Um, so again, powerful people. Um, so just to reiterate, these are at the beginning and end of the rules. So these are pretty important people to be speaking to. Um, but there are two things to note about this is that um, among these groups is not the vice president executive council who would have helped him rule um, as well as there's also the fact that uh, among this list of people, um, most of them seem to be in the city of Bombay, which is significant because in the history of the British Empire in India, Bombay was never the capital. Um, it was Kolkata till 1910 or Calcutta. Um, and then in 1910, it became New Delhi, but never Bombay. So um, Bombay is the location where 54 out of 84 speeches were made. Um, and you can see also 12 out of 14 of the vices were talking about Bombay in the other graph. And, um, but Bombay is a uh, prominent port city and has had a great history of trade, particularly opium and cotton. Um, so groups like the Bombay Chamber of Commerce, who I mentioned in the previous slide, um, were extremely successful traders. So this is why perhaps the vice immediately wants to be talking to people in Bombay. So if we look at specifically, Lord Harding is the top mentioned, uh, mentioned probably the most, and Lord Willington followed him. So I'll be focusing a little on what they were actually saying. Um, so what do the vice was actually bring up in speeches? So if we look at the first one, Lord Harding, who mentioned Bombay the most, talks about something called the Bombay Relief Fund. This is in 1916, um, around the time of the First World War. And he talks about money being donated, freely subscribed uh, with the money freely subscribed by all classes in the city and presidency of Bombay. Both money and personal service have been given most freely and generously, not as a duty, but we desire to do all that is possible to secure success for our arms. Um, so he is praising the city for giving financially. So Bombay is important financially. But it's interesting to note that. Um, uh, here, the the person who's supposed to be the head of an of of a British of the British Empire, which is supposed to have all power, is still having to ask for money for support for empire's activities like war. 
Um, and if you move on to 19th, the speech made in 1936 by Lord Willington, uh, when he's talking to the Bombay Chamber of Commerce, he mentions that India's credit stands high. The Bombay Chamber of Commerce has, to, has helped uh, improve the economy financially. But he also says something interesting. He says one very large element has been the restoration of law and order to the country, which has been the constant preoccupation of my government, myself, during my regime. So along with the praising the Bombay Chamber of Commerce for supporting Empire financially, he says, but we are together. Um, my role in my role as a viceroy, I have been critical to restoring law and order. And it's interesting because. Um, the whole reason for the British crown coming into India was to um, was because the East India Company um, was running havoc. So this they um, they wanted to bring in some stability, but here they are still trying having to appeal to financial actors for to support um, the government. And in 1936, of course, the Second World War is about to break out soon. Um, they've been hit by the First World War, and independence is not too far away in 1947. So um there perhaps there is more of a need to emphasize the importance of the viceroy and his role um so as i was talking a bit about war war is a big preoccupation of the viceroy 10 out of 14 viceroys do mention war um and there's a spike particularly um between 1916 and 20 and then 1942 to 47 um these are of the same graph but um because of, I was using matplotlib, they have to be two separate graphs, but it is the same thing. Um, so you can see war was a big preoccupation of the viceroys. And who were they actually talking to about war? It was actually, funny enough, the princely states, um, not exactly uh, a group you would consider immediately that they might be speaking to. Um, but the narrative to the uh, princely states, the princely states were um, a group of Indian princes in the chamber of princes, and um, they supported the empire largely. But the support here also that the, that the Viceroy mentions is similarly financial support, thank you, valuable help you've given to the war effort, but also without thank you for the help that I have had in the efforts I have made while I have been Viceroy to further modernization of administration in the states. Um, so here, um, Lord Linnitka is talking about um, how, again, flattering the, prince, uh, the Chamber of Princes for giving money to support empire, but at the same time, he is saying that um, my role has been critical in this. Again, this is in 1943. Um, in 1947, independence happened. So at this point, there was talk about this freedom struggle was quite strong. Um, so at this point, we would say that the Viceroy was definitely trying to push the importance of himself and his government here. So just to summarize um, my points, um, the Vaishwa's speeches indicate that rather than Empire having absolute power that to actively work to maintain that image, the speeches worked kind of almost as damage control in the later years to say this is the role um, that I can I can play while at the same time having to ask for money having, and the end of empire pretty much came from um, losing money in the wars. Um, and with political and economic bodies, then appeal to financial support was necessary to maintain government activities, but the vice role had to be consistently asserted. And um, going back a bit to the lexical diversity, as opposed to modern leaders today, um, there are many countries having elections this year, so this will resonate. Um, you're trying to show you're different from your predecessors, from other parties, but the Viceroy is notoriously wanted to show that they were, uh, that they used, they used stability and lack of change to show their strength. And this is associated with ensuring the continuity of empire. In fact, many were even, many were even from the same families, um, as the same group of nobles, giving the same narrative over time. Um, and yeah, so to go back to this point, why legal language? Legal language therefore allows us to um, delve deeper into hierarchies of power through these speeches, allows us to identify ways in which the viceroy uses language in their office to present, depict, and execute the goals of empire. Um, thank you.